The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Breaking the ice. Um, all right, so I am Stacia Van Zetten. I work for Ellis Dawn, which is a construction management company um, over in Toronto. Um, for those of you that don't know, we build buildings all over Canada and in various areas internationally. Personally, I provide materials-based technical support for many of our projects. So as Terry had to change his topic a little bit, um, I started putting together this presentation and I realized that it's not just about um, the hot weather, it's controlling SCC when you have to cool it in general. But the main purpose of this presentation is to cover um, a case study of a project that we're building down in South America and the issues that we ran into while doing so. So let's start with the basics of why do we even need to co cool concrete in the first place. The main point here is to control the exotherm and temperature differentials. ACI 301 and 305 limit maximum concrete uh, temperature to 35 degrees Celsius. Um, but the simple truth of the matter is that concrete placed and cured at lower temperatures, not too low, um, will typically outperform in strength and durability. The other problem with warm con warmer concrete is cracking. Um, the maximum specified temperatures are necessary to help control early cracking concrete, often caused by steep temperature gradient through the concrete, um, caused by the cooling of the surface when the concrete has very low strength. Um, after hydration starts, concrete will gain in temperature, reaching a maximum, which will depend on the member thickness, um, the type and quality of, or quanti quantity of cement. Um, and as soon as the concrete begins to cool, the gradient, which depends strongly upon external temperature, will determine the cracking risk of that concrete. During this phase, if the concrete is able to generate tensile stresses higher than the tensile strength of the concrete, a crack will appear. So in our case, we're building a tower called Atrio Dam in Bogota, Colombia. Um, and instantly you'd look at this map and as I had to change the title, you'd say, okay, it's hot weather. Um, but actually, Bogota is located in that little yellow dot and these are the average temperatures. Um, so why do we need to cool the concrete? As I mentioned, um, the tower is not your typical tower that you'd see down in that area. Um, many of the mixes are high strength, specialized self-consolidating concrete, meaning a higher cement factor um, for some very large elements. So during our pre-qual stage, in order to keep the maximum exotherm below the 65 degrees Celsius that was specified, we needed to cool the concrete. Um, so this poses the issue. We're in a location that isn't necessarily high ambient temperatures, um, but they still need, and, oops, sorry, and the typical concrete down there is like 25 to 35 MPA low-rise buildings. Um, so they generally don't need to cool the concrete there, which also means that this is a new experience for them and it ended up being a learning experience for us. Um, so for our, from this, our pre, uh, from our pre-qualification, we had to limit the concrete to 22 degrees Celsius. So with the supplier, we discussed the options for cooling the concrete. This isn't necessarily all the options that are available, but this is <laughs> what they could possibly do. So option one, obviously use ice um, to replace a percentage of the mixed water. Um, option two, you can use liquid nitrogen. In Canada, we use it a lot and it's great because it doesn't necessarily affect the moisture compensa compensation, um, but the logistics down there didn't allow that to happen. Option three, cooling the materials. We found that the temperature of the aggreg aggregate piles um, would vary greatly throughout the day. Um, we were measuring the aggregate in the morning and it was six degrees and then later in the afternoon it was the high 20s. Um, so to help lower the overall temperature of your mix, we can look into cooling the mixed ingredients by using chilled water. Um, aggregates can be cooled by spraying them with water. As a rule of thumb, the temperature of concrete can be reduced by about half a degree, um, degree Celsius, sorry, with a four degree reduction in cement temperature, a two degree 
uh, reduction in water temperature and a one degree reduction in aggregate temperature. So what we did, we had to uh, cool the concrete using ice and we put some controls on cooling the materials, um, but they weren't really used to doing that. So it was a slow evolving process <laughs> throughout the project. Um, ACI 305 provides equations for estimating the temperature of freshly mixed concrete based on the temperature and mass of your materials. Um, the amount of ice that we used in Bogota ended up ranging from 70 to 100 kgs. Um, and if you look at the mixed design, the water itself is 174 kilograms. If you're assuming about a 2% moisture in the sand, 9%, let's say, in the rock, that's 30 kilograms, so you only have 144 left. So that's about 50 to 70% replacement with ice which is a lot to control for someone that hasn't really done it. <laughs> so it's great that we can calculate the temperature that needs to be and how much ice that we're gonna need to be able to get there. Um, but what challenges did we actually face in the field um, on the site? So one is the geometry and size of the ice. It plays a big factor on the efficiency of the heat effusion that it can provide. Uh, mainly the different surfaces will melt at different rates. So consistency in size and shape can predict how the ice will perform and affect the concrete. Uh, for example, flake ice has much more efficient temperature drop, um, as you can see from the graph on the right. And the photo on the left shows a setup of flake ice production that you will sometimes see at ready mix plants. Um, unfortunately, what we're finding is that if you don't have the ability to have something like that at your plant, um, and you're not directly um, putting the flake ice into your mix, the ice would uh, melt and clump together, so it would cause variability in the way that it affects your mix. Um, as you can see from this graph, this, um, this is a slump at the plant, the blue dots, and then the slump at the site using the flake ice. So there's a lot of variability in how fast it's melting um, versus this graph that shows the use of cubed ice, um, which is more uniform in size. Um, it might not be as efficient in the cooling, but it shows less variability. Um, so as I mentioned, the supplier didn't have on-site ice machines, uh, or sorry, on plant, in plant ice machines, and all of the ice was ordered in bags and added to the mixers in different ways depending on the plant. So for our raft slab, we were supplying from five different locations, and each plant had a different way of inputting the ice. Um, for example, this is one of them. There were actually two scissor lifts at one point, so one would be on the ground and they'd be loading the bags on, and then the other one would be at the top throwing the bags in, or the ice in. Um, and then here's another one. It's a bad picture, but they were storing the ice on top of the hill in a secant, and then they created this slide that they'd slide the ice down into the back of the truck. So the issues with this is that it's very labor intensive. Um, we're relying on the workers to keep track of how many bags they added, which we found out sometimes was wrong. <laughs> and the ice would be, the light, ice would be left out to melt. So we actually weighed one of the bags that said 20 kg and it was only 18 or 17. Um, eventually, one of the plants got a conveyor, which um, we thought would help the process because not, it's not as labor intensive. Um, but as I mentioned before, when we were using the flake ice, it would clump together and then cause blockage actually before even getting into the hopper. Uh, another challenge is dealing with the traffic and the time of day. Uh, the ready mix supplier had done extensive study to show how long it takes to get from to our project from each of their plants. Um, as you can see, a couple examples, but those are just snippets at one point in the day. Um, so that we ended up doing an extensive study on uh, the times during how long it would take at different times of the day. So you can see from midnight to 5 a.m. takes almost half the time than from 8 a.m. till 6 p.m. It's in Spanish. So. Um, so when you couple that with the increase of temperature throughout the day, um, you end up needing to increase the amount of ice, um, the amount of ice being used to cool the concrete. Um, this graph shows it pretty well at different times of the day, and then it shows the maximum and minimum ambient temperatures for those pores. They actually used 110 kilograms. Lastly, material variations play a huge role in controlling SCC when using ice. Issue one with this photo is the cross-contamination oh, the cross contamination of the piles, which obviously will affect, affect your mix, but also you can see the moisture gradient with the top surface being drier. Um, the supplier told us that they took moistures once a day, but we ended up at one point changing this to every two hours to get an understanding of how the moistures were changing. Again, it's important to combine the materials in, in your stockpiles, 
Oh, that's them taking moisture. Um, <laughs> for coarse aggregate stockpiles, recombining and sprinkling them with water to maintain a uniform moisture and temperature gradient. Uh, this is a clause from CSA just saying that frequent checks will help. Uh, again, preventing contamination by making sure that the barriers are high enough, um, your stockpiles are sloped to drain. As you can see here, there's a big puddle, um, which would affect the moisture in your mix. Um, a big thing that we learned from this case study is that it's important to be collecting as much data as possible to be able to conclude on what's affecting your mix and to what extent. Um, plastic prop properties are always important when working with SCC because obviously it's like walking on a tightrope. Um, very sensitive mixes. So the smallest change in the challenges that I mentioned previously can drastically change the way that the mix performs. So these are the parameters that we made sure to measure and record and stay within. Um, the time between batching, we had a maximum 2.5 hours with hydration stabilizer. Some flow 600 to 700 millimeters, 250, 2 to 5 seconds, VSI obviously, temperature and air. And this is an example of them actually taking the data. This is before we got two involved, and you can see the slump at the plant versus the slump at site. It varies like crazy. There's, it leaves the plant at 49 centimeters and gets to site at 67 leaves at 52, gets to site at 61. So you can see the variability. So I know I kind of bounced back and forth between what went wrong and what should have been done, but the point was to show you that you have to work with what is available. Um, and it's very important to record all the data so you can analyze what's making the largest effect. Um, this is what we learned just based on this specific project, um, that the shape of the ice can affect the consistency of the fresh concrete. Uh, you need to control the way you add the ice you need to cool your materials by chilling water, shading aggregate, uh, maximize stockpile size and moisture uniformity. Uh, Pre-planning your pour is obviously around traffic and depending on the location you're in and to monitor the fresh properties. Um, obviously, all of this is very important with SCC because it's such a sensitive material. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any questions for her? It looks yeah. like the, this is a mass concrete application. You said there not was a large, in, not, uh, not in right? every case. Um, mm -hmm. The raft sub yeah, that was that was mass concrete. Some of our columns are two meters in yeah. diameter, but and, not everything. And now you are adding uh, ice, so it makes a little bit more sense. The water, this, this is very sensitive to water, but yeah. adding ice makes it a little bit more critical than the regular SCC. Yeah, because correct? there's so many vari variables, variables yeah. within but the ice itself. But you've been able to uh, control this. Huh? I this mean, project. it's been a learning experience, right? Yeah. For everybody. And you so. made it also very clear to us that you are not using ice from the grocery store. You are yeah. having this shape, <laughs> shape, <laughs> not the cube, not the, not the cube of ice. You know? It's important because it wouldn't melt yeah. on time. Exactly. Thank you very much. Any other questions for her? No? Thank you. Now,